Well, hello friends and welcome to another Ask Zach. I hope you're doing well. Today we're going to talk about one of my uh, favorite Telecaster players and someone that really influenced me a lot and uh, uh, and uh, and I just have a world of respect for the guy and it's Ricky Skaggs. And uh, I kind of think of him as the reluctant guitar hero or maybe I should say to more accurately say the reluctant Telecaster hero. So... Uh, he has a great story and a great story about how he ended up playing the telly and uh, and uh, being the lead player in his band for for years. So, uh, yeah. So uh, if you've been enjoying the show uh, and if you haven't subscribed, please do so. Uh, if you've subscribed already, I'd love it if you would support the show by going to AskZach.com and you can pick up a T-shirt or a coffee mug or a hat or a sticker or there's a tip jar information in the description if you want to do that. All right, so Ricky Skaggs. I'm going to start off by telling a, a, a ridiculous story about uh, the first time I saw Ricky Skaggs play. So my father was a Ford and Nissan dealer. And there was, and of course, I, I grew up in South Texas in a little town called Kingsville. So... My parents were really cool in that they would include us on a lot of business trips. Uh, you know, a lot of the other dealers, when they would go to these meetings, you know, they wouldn't take their kids. Uh, but my parents would. And so I really appreciate that. So thanks, mom and dad. Uh, so on one of these was, uh, it was in Nashville. And, uh, you know, and so we all, you know, flew up to Nashville and we stayed at the Opryland Hotel which it was much smaller at that point because this was about 1985. And we went there and I just have to say, at this point, I was not playing the guitar yet. And I was not really into music, really. I mean, I was hearing the music that was on the school bus and maybe some stuff my mom listened to more classical music. My dad would listen to some country music, but uh, we tend to not play a lot of music in the, in, in the house. So... We get to Nashville, and uh, uh, we're we're told that we're gonna go to the uh, we're gonna go to the Opry, and I had no idea what that was. I didn't know what the Grand Ole Opry was. Here I am, I'm around twelve, and uh, oh, I I didn't know if this was gonna be an opera or what what kind of thing it was gonna be. So anyway, so we go, and of course the Opryland Hotel is right next to you know where you know the Opry House. And so we took a little, you know, tram shuttle thing that took us from the Opryland Hotel with the other, you know, Ford dealers. And uh, we got, got to the Opry and we sit down and here's this, you know, I mean, this is a pretty good size auditorium and there's this big wooden stage and there's this, you know, kind of barn looking, you know, thing and wood and such. And like, what is this? And then all of a sudden it starts up and there's, you know, clogging and square dancers and, uh, and, uh, and this guy comes out, uh, and he's got a mullet and uh, a purple Telecaster and, uh, and he's all, yeehaw, you know, I'm Ricky Skaggs and these are the Skaggettes. <laughs> and I thought that was the stupidest thing I'd ever seen in my life. And it, it didn't matter that the music was great. And, you know, they did uncle pin and probably love's going to get you or something like that. And anyway, um, uh, his musicality and talent was completely lost on me. And the only thing that stuck with me was the fact that he said, I'm Ricky Skaggs and these are the Skaggettes, which of course, you know, uh, so I went around for the rest of the trip that we were in the Nashville area, everywhere we went, you know, I would mutter, you know, to the side of my mouth, I'm Ricky Skaggs and these are the Skaggettes. And finally, after wearing my father out, who was pretty patient, uh, he looked at me in the eye and he said, son, if you say that again, I'm going to pop you in the chest. And it wasn't five minutes later, I said it again. And he gave me one of those quick whack, you know, right as we were walking side by side. And he gave me a whack to the chest. And, uh, and uh, I was like, oh, and I stopped. I didn't say Ricky Skaggs and the Skaggettes uh, again uh, until now. So. Anyway, 
Fast forward a couple of years, I start playing the guitar and I start getting, you know, serious about it. I'm originally kind of more into blues and, uh, you know, and rock and roll and Seaver Vaughan and the, the T-Birds and stuff like that. And I start listening to Clapton. Through Clapton, I hear Albert Lee on the Just One Night album. Uh, and then I start doing research on Albert Lee and found out, you know, records that he'd played on and started buying those. Well, I found out he played with this guy named Ricky Skeggs and I was like, wait a second. Didn't I see that guy? And uh, so I started buying Ricky Skaggs records. And all of a sudden I found out, whoa, this guy is a heavy duty, you know, guitar player, mandolin, you know, plays mandolin and fiddle, pr uh, produces his own records. Uh, you know, I was performed on a bunch of the Emmy Lou uh, and hot band records, even before he joined the hot band. Uh, you know, amazing harmony singer. Uh, yeah. So I started buying Ricky Skaggs albums and I quickly went from being a, a, a naysayer to, uh, uh, you know, a fan. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to give a little bit of, uh, you know, a history of Ricky Skaggs. So this is what you need to know about Ricky Skaggs. So Ricky Skaggs was born in eastern Kentucky and, uh, you know, grew up around bluegrass and, uh, you know, originally, you know, started playing mandolin. Then he added, you know, fiddle and acoustic guitar to that. Um, played in some pretty, you know, important bluegrass bands, including, you know, playing with Ralph Stanley, along with Keith Whitley, who, of course, another um, well, the late Keith Whitley, a very important uh, country singer. Uh, you get to the uh, J.D. Crow and the New South which is very seminal and very important bluegrass, you know, record where it was kind of pushing the boundaries. It wasn't new grass, but they were doing, um, you know, they were doing like Gordon Lightfoot songs and different, different things like that. And you had Tony Rice as the lead guitarist and lead vocalist. You had Ricky sing in high harmony and you had, uh, and mandolin and fiddle and you had uh, uh, Jerry Douglas playing Dobro. And of course the great JD, Crow playing, uh, you know, playing banjo. And that was a, an amazing record. Then Ricky uh, started getting kind of interested in other instrumentation and uh, kind of country and uh, rock and roll instrumentation. And he had a group called Boone Creek. And uh, that had uh, Jerry Douglas in it. And that started kind of using some electric bass and things like that. And also at the same time, he's starting to work with Emilio Harris. And at first he's just playing on her records. He's not touring with her. Um, but then, uh, Rodney Crowell, who was the original kind of rhythm guitarist and harmony singer in the hot band left because he had gotten a solo deal with Warner brothers. And so, uh, Ricky Skaggs was, uh, was called on to, uh, to be the new harmony singer. And with that, you know, Ricky took the band in a, a, a different direction because, you know, here's this dyed in the wool you know, bluegrass guy. And, you know, he's such a great, you know, mandolin fiddle player, acoustic guitar player. And, uh, you know, he's playing with this incredible band, you know, originally when he joined the hot band, Albert Lee was the uh, lead guitar player. And then later was Frank Ricard, uh, you know, and you have Emory Gordy and, and John Ware and Hank DeVito and these, you know, these great, great players. Uh, also during that time, uh, Ricky's, you know, gotten a, a, a solo deal with Sugar Hill, which is a, a bluegrass label. And, uh, let me see if I can, uh, find one of these guys. Here it is. So, and, and this has a, you know, he has a, a, he has a great, great look here. So you get this album, it's called Sweet Temptation. And, uh, this is you know, Ricky Skaggs under the influence of the hot band. And so the hot band plays on this. Well, some of them do. And, uh, you know, and it has kind of some bluegrass tunes and it has more country tunes like Sweet Temptation, which is a old Merle Travis song. But then it has things like Cabin Home on a Hill. Uh, so th this is a great album. Albert, Albert Lee plays lead guitar on it. Buddy Emmons plays steel. Uh, also, you know, he... Uh, I'm just going to do a quick mention of this. This is Skaggs and Rice. This is just Ricky Skaggs and Tony Rice just singing together. And then, of course, Tony playing acoustic guitar and Ricky playing mandolin. This is an amazing record, and I highly recommend it. All right. Then, 
let's see. So Ricky's in the hot band. Uh, and so he's learning about drums. He's learning about production from Brian Ahern. Um, he's uh, learning about electric guitar. He's learning about electric bass. He's learning about all these things. And he's learning about country music and this kind of new hybrid rockabilly, folky country stuff that, you know, that Emily and the Hot Band are doing. Because uh, it's not straight up, you know, country music. It's kind of, you know, charged up and with a, you know, hot Telecaster player, you know, whether it was James Burton or Albert Lee. So he, uh, he finally leaves, you know, the, the hot band and, uh, cause he gets a, a, a record deal with, uh, with CBS or Epic, you know, which is now, I guess, you know, you'd call it Sony. Well, and while he was touring, you know, with Emmy Lou, he found his own Telecaster player to play in his band and his name was Ray Flack. So what's what's interesting is Ricky kind of went from the hot band to a solo deal and he basically recreated his own version of the hot band. And so, you know, Ray Flack was his Albert, Albert Lee, you know, compared to, you know, the hot band. And Ray is a very worthy successor of uh, of, of Albert Lee. And uh, so so he puts together, you know, this band and they start playing, you know, his version of this hybrid music where it's got this charged rockabilly folk country thing. But then also you have the bluegrass thing from him. And so you have this whole new style of music. It's like electric bluegrass, you know, country. And, uh, and his, his albums were amazing and groundbreaking. And they called him a neo-traditionalist and all sorts of things like that. And he won awards. And, uh, you know, and his band was amazing. He always has, I mean, to this day, he's always had the most amazing, you know, players in his band. And uh, here's kind of where we get to, uh, you know, the title of the video and, and kind of the thrust of this. So there's footage on, on, uh, on YouTube of Ricky playing on Austin City Limits with uh, Ray Flack in the band. And Ray's playing his old 68 telly. Uh, with a white pit guard, and it looks like he's using the Lab Series amp with an Echoplex on it, and uh, and the band is just smoking. And whenever Ray takes a solo, it's almost like fireworks are going off. And Ray is just really on his game, and uh, it's great video clips. And I I highly recommend that you you know go and track those down. But uh, you know. You know, I, I just, I don't know how to, you know, I'm going to say this the best way as possible uh, because I love Ray Flax playing and, and the times I've been around him have been great, but evidently he could be difficult to be around at times. And evidently, you know, Ray and Ricky weren't getting along and so they parted ways, which was unfortunate because that was a great, uh, it was a great combination. You know, Ricky playing acoustic guitar and, and, mandolin and and uh and and fiddle and even playing uh, a mandocaster which was a little electric telecaster that looked like well it was an electric mandolin that looked like a telecaster and had a bender on it that joe glazer made he made the whole instrument and they had such great interplay but uh you know they parted ways and then you know what ricky has said in interviews was albert lee was playing with eric clapton at the time and he couldn't afford James Burton, and there wasn't anyone out there that played in that style. So again, this is the early 1980s, and there aren't a bunch of, you know, hot, you know, Telecaster players out there at that point. It's just, it hasn't become the thing that it became later on. And uh, so Ricky, faced with that thing, with that situation, he decided, you know, and his apparently his wife Sharon, uh, you know, kind of pushed him on this was you can do this yourself. And so he had played a little bit of electric guitar, you know, on, uh, you know, on highways and heartaches. I think there was a song or two where he had played some string bender kind of fills on a slower tune, but you know, he hadn't really played Telecaster out in front of anyone. And he took it upon himself to go back and learn the, you know, the Albert Lee guitar parts that were on some of his, you know, songs and also the, uh, the Ray Flack parts that were on a lot of his hits. And so he learned those guitar parts 
and he had, you know, he had a telly, you know, with a string bender on it. And, uh, and he, you know, and at the time, you know, Ray had been using this Lab Series L9 amp, which is a transistorized amp that had a built-in compressor and had a 15-inch EV. And he, uh, you know, played through one of those and, uh, and he pulled it off. And he's, you know, in the interviews, he's indicated, you know, he was really kind of holding his breath and, you know, just trying to make it through. But he ended up doing a really great job. And he ended up being a great telly player. And I think what made him a great player was that he hadn't, you know, he, one, he had had the example of he had been in a band with Albert Lee. Two, he had had Ray Flack in his band. He had done sessions with James Burton and all these other you know, great players. And so he knew that and he knew about tone. On top of that, he was a great musician already. He already had, you know, fiddle, guitar and mandolin under his belt and, and knew, you know, melodies and good playing and such. And so he, he took all of that. And he was able to, uh, you know, create a guitar style that was very much himself. I mean, in some ways it was based on what Albert Lee and, and Flack had done on his records, but also he just kind of had his own thing where he just played, he played very melodic. He played hooks and he never just played useless, look at me, look at me, look at me notes. He always played things that were fitting and kind of bluesy sounding. And so my hat's off to Ricky Skaggs for, uh, you know, becoming a reluctant Telecaster hero for, uh, you know, stepping up and, uh, and learning how to play uh, Telecaster and for, you know, learning how to get a good sound on one. And he, he certainly did. So this is a good point to uh, uh, talk about, you know, his, uh, his tone and, and kind of the guitars that he used, especially in the 1980s. So... Uh, the guitar he was seen the most playing was a purple uh, Glazer made uh, Telecaster type style guitar, and so it had a uh, it had a f very flame maple neck. And talking to Joe, he was able to get flame maple from uh, from Paul Reed Smith at that time in the in the early to mid 1980s, and he said it was unique because uh, it was more stable than most flame maple. You know, a lot of flame maple would kind of move around a lot, and so he was able to get some really highly flame maple that was that was stable so you have this very uh flame maple neck and then uh, you had this uh you know purple body that was single bound and you had a, had a white pick guard had a you know this type of goto bridge and the string bender like this one and then you had uh you know the back pickup which at that point was an alnico 2 pro and the you know by seymour duncan the front pickup was the vintage uh telly you know rhythm pickup and then uh, later on, a middle pickup was was added, which was, of course, the Strat Stack, which, uh, you know, is also, you know, like on Brent Mason's guitar, except that on, on Ricky's, it has the, uh, you know, the blade is showing through and it has a white cover instead of the red cover like uh, like Brent Mason's. So he had that guitar. And uh, back in the day, he used uh, GHS Boomers 10 through 46. And those are uh, those are pure nickel with a hex core. And he had acrylic nails on these two fingers and most of the time he used a light gauge pick and so if you listen to him i mean he really pops the hell out of the strings and uh and it and it's a really neat sound so you kind of have this e you know kind of lighter pick sound but then he'll pop the the strings a lot with those ac acrylic nails and it's a really really uh neat sound so i've made a spotify playlist of course and uh it's really neat hearing him on Live from London where he's playing those songs that Ray Flack had played lead on. And then you get to hear his version of that, which is, you know, which is great also. Um, as far as amps, he was, uh, Ricky, you know, back at that time was using a Lab Series L9, which was this Gibson made Moog designed amp that, uh, and I owned one, actually I owned two at one point. They're really neat amps. Um, they have a really cool compressor on it. And from talking to Ricky's guitar tech, you know, years ago, he would set it to where the compressor would come on when he would pop the B string and bend it. And so that was kind of the way he, and it lights up. So that, that's the way he would set it if you have one of those amps. 
And uh, yeah, it has a really unique tone control section, it has a fat sound. The EV, the 15 inch EV is a big part of the sound. And uh, those are really cool amps. And if you want the Ricky Skaggs Ray Flack sound that, that, you know, a good telly and then that Lab Series L9 is a big part of it. And uh, that'll, that'll get you there. And it has a good sounding, you know, reverb on it, kind of fendery. And uh, effects wise, most of the time he would use a Roland Space Echo and sometimes he'd put a little chorus on it. Like the thing I played at the beginning was uh, you know, just a little, you know, kind of take on uh, Walking in Jerusalem, which it was cool because he was playing on the neck pickup and it had some chorus, which I'm assuming came from the Roland you know, Space Echo. It was probably like the 501 or 300 series, whichever. And, uh, and then it had some slap back on there. And then of course the compressor on the Lab Series amp, and uh, and that was that was kind of you know his sound you know of course most of the time he would he would play on the on the bridge pick I mean he didn't have chorus on all the time, but uh, he played some some really really cool stuff especially in those those mid eighties you know records where he was the the lead player. Later on, he started having either, you know, Steve Gibson or Albert Lee or Brent Mason, you know, play electric on his records. But uh, I really enjoyed his uh, his lead playing uh, in on the album, My Father's Son, which was about 90 or 91. He covered Only Daddy, the, Only Daddy That'll Walk the Line. I never can't say that straight for some reason. But uh, on that, he kind of did some really cool string bender stuff. And I'll play a little bit of that. So the, the song's in E, and when it goes to the four chord, which, you know, which is an, an A, he plays this kind of partial A, this. And, and then he, act, he activates the bender, so you get this kind of thing. And then you get this next chord shape that he plays, which is an A9. And then when you activate the bender, you get, it It takes the, the fifth up to a six, so it kind of turns it into a uh, an A13, I guess. And then he goes up and plays, you know, this kind of A7, where the B bender takes it up to the, uh, to the tonic note, so you get this so here, I'll just kind of play the whole thing. So that's a, a cool, uh, you know, thing that he did on uh, Only Daddy to Walk the Line. And uh, I, I loved his Telecaster playing. I loved his his B bender work. His 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 Telecaster playing was was fairly dependent on the B bender. And he wouldn't really want to play electric guitar unless he had a, a, a bender on it to the point that I think he was playing at a Paul Reed Smith event. Uh, and uh, Brent Mason was going to be there too. And, and uh, Paul wanted, you know, uh, Brent Mason and, and Ricky Skaggs to, to jam together. And, uh, and Ricky said, only if you'll build me an electric guitar with a B bender on it. And he did. And of course, Paul Reed Smith did because he's that kind of guy. Uh, I've, I've seen uh, Ricky even have a, a acoustic with a B-Bender on it, uh, um, you know, some different, a Loudon and maybe even a Paul Reed Smith acoustic that had a, had a B-Bender on it. So very, very neat stuff. Uh, let's see. One thing I, I wanted to talk about, uh, oh, in the last couple of years, uh, you know, you know, Ricky has played electric again. And it, I think one of the really neat things about Ricky Skaggs is he's kind of reinvented himself over and over again. You know, it's kind of like he was the bluegrass guy as a kid. He was the kind of bluegrassy sideman with, with Emmy Lou and then kind of went into country music. Then he's playing this country hybrid music. Then he's a Telecaster guy. You know, then, you know, in the mid nineties as, his kind of country career started kind of winding down and people weren't paying as much attention to him. He went back to bluegrass and he really became one of the standard bearers of, you know, of acoustic, you know, bluegrass music. And, uh, and, you know, and, and he gave his, his career a whole new, you know, a whole new boost. And uh, I think what's been cool in the last decade or so is that he has done, uh, 
he has done, he started, you know, kind of playing some electric again. So, you know, this uh, poster on the wall is from when uh, Ricky was playing uh, with his wife, Sharon White, and with Ry Cooter. And on that, he was playing electric guitar. And so it was really cool. I, you know, of course, I was at, at that show and at one other show that was in Knoxville. And uh, at that point, he was playing his 57 telly, which it's uh, been painted red. Uh, Joe Glazer painted it in what he calls Ricky Red. It's got a perloid pit guard on it. And it's got the Goto bridge and the B bender, you know, like like this guitar. And uh, and uh, he doesn't play through the Lab Series amp anymore. He's been playing through uh, either a Blackface Pro Reverb or a Brown Vibralux. I think the Brown Vibralux is the influence of uh, Gordon Kennedy. So I know he really likes that amp. And of course, the two of them have worked together. But it's it's been cool to see, you know, Ricky playing electric again after all these years. And he's still a great, great uh, telly player and, and does, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of cool things. So uh, I just want to show this. So this is another uh, this is another neat Ricky Skaggs album. Um, this one was recorded partially with the hot band in the 70s and then partially uh, with his current country band later on in the 80s. And what this was is that he basically had an album together when he got his deal with CBS, but Sugar Hill owned these tracks. And it wasn't until later that they're, you know, you can see this says Sugar Hill and Epic on there that they released. So this uh, this is a neat album and it has both Ray Flack and Albert Lee playing on it, not on the same cuts, but, uh, you know, the Don't Cheat in Our Hometown is some really cool B-Bender stuff by Albert Lee. Honey, Won't You Open That Door, more B-Bender stuff by Albert. Um, I'm Head Over Heels in Love With You. That's a, another, you know, great, uh, Albert plays tons of solos on that. And uh, you get to hear a little bit of uh, Ray Flack on uh, Uncle Penn. He plays a, a cool, uh, you know, a little, little solo on there. So that's a, that's a favorite. So... That's uh, that's kind of the the deal with Ricky Skaggs. Uh, the thing at the beginning that I played uh, was from uh, you know walking in Jerusalem, and I, I love that you know little thing. And so I guess this will be kind of the the lesson thing. Besides, of course, playing the I was showing you that B bender stuff, but you have this. Um, I guess I'll I won't put I won't put the chorus on, but I'll just. So you have this, you know, kind of, you know, basically playing an A chord and playing an alternating bass. Yeah, I really love that snappy thing, and he would pop it really hard to you though. I'm gonna play one more time, a little slower. So go out and listen to some Ricky Skaggs, great Telecaster player. I listened to my Spotify playlist and, uh, you know, learn, pop the hell out of the strings and uh, just have a good time. Because remember, I'm Ricky Skaggs and these are the Skaggats. All right. See you next time. Bye-bye.